being the first for the new year. I wish you a happy, bright, and prosperous 2024. Happy New Year to all. These press conferences, as you, as you are aware, are designed to bring a new sense of openness, a sense of accountability to the inner workings of the Nevis Island administration. As per usual, the Premier will make his statement, and members of the press corps will be given the opportunity to ask their questions. In so doing, we kindly ask you to give your name and the organization that you represent. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, join me in welcoming to the podium the Honorable Premier of Nevis, Mark A.G. Brantley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you as always to our permanent secretary, uh, Mr. Wakely Daniel, who has been with me on this journey uh, as my introducer <laughs> over the past several years. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone, and thank you to the members of the press who are here. And if there are others on the way, as you know, we try to start on time. And so it is 10 o'clock, it is time to go. And so I thank you very much. As P.S. Daniel has indicated, this is an opportunity for members of the press to engage and for me to engage with the Fourth Estate. A free and independent press is very important to a strong democracy, and we are committed to that here and to that engagement with members of the press, and so I'm truly grateful that we have this opportunity in a free and open society to engage with you and to take your questions. As the format dictates, this is our first press conference for the year. We try to do this every month, at least once per month. And uh, I'm happy that notwithstanding we're just a day before the month ends that we are here in January to bring this press conference. Someone commented on social media that January appears to be a little long this year because we've been in January for quite a while, so it seems. So I'm happy that it's long this year because I get a chance to uh, have the press conference in January as committed. Let me start, ladies and gentlemen, with a few words of condolences. Let me extend our deepest condolences to the family of our former Assistant Commissioner, Joseph Leibert. Mr. Leibert, who passed away, we are advised, on the 18th of January, uh, is someone who is known to us all. His family is a well-known family, and he has served us as a nation, not just in Nevis, but the wider St. Kitts and Nevis, as our Assistant Commissioner of Police. He has served on the Electoral Commission. He has served in various capacities. In fact, he was a critical part of the Nevis end of the peace program that was introduced to try to redirect some of our youths onto more useful and productive pathways. And uh, we were aware that he was ailing, but certainly his passing came as a bit of a surprise. And so we certainly uh, apologize uh, to, to all in terms of if we have uh, not uh, correctly identified all of his contribution, but certainly as former Assistant Commissioner, we know that he has made a tremendous contribution. And so we reach out to his family members that survive him to extend our deepest condolences on his loss. And I'm fairly certain that in the fullness of time, we'll have an opportunity to engage and certainly to express our condolences more fully uh, to the former Assistant Commissioner, Joseph Leibert. As I'm in that mood of condolences, let me also extend deepest condolences to the family of my dear friend, Leroy David, formerly of Craddock Road, who passed away in the United States. Uh, he was well known to many and had made a life for himself in the US, I believe in the New York area, and would want to join uh, the multitude in expressing our condolences to him, to his family, I'm sorry, those that survive him. Uh, the David family is a well-known family from Craddock Road, the Craddock Road area, and so I extend condolences to them all. Let me also extend condolences to the family of my dearly departed cousin, Evelyn Mulrain of Hanley's Road, uh, to her children who survive her, um, Tony and Marita. I want to extend my deepest condolences to her grandchildren, to all of those who mourn her passing, and to the community of Jehovah's Witnesses. She was a, a witness for many years, and I would want to extend my condolences to them all. Evelyn was somebody who was known and loved by all. She was a woman of incredible grace and beauty, 
and I would want to extend my condolences to those who mourn at this difficult time. If you allow me, I will segue from extending condolences to extending some words of congratulations. I start by congratulating President-elect Mr. Lai Ching Ti and Vice President-elect Ms. Bai Kim of Taiwan on the victory of the Democratic Progressive Party. They were victorious in the recently held presidential elections on 13th of January. I have extended congratulations publicly before, but since we did not have a press conference, uh, let me take the opportunity to do so now. And I'm to ask our dear friend, Ambassador Michael Lin, to convey to the President-elect and Vice President-elect our warmest congratulations. I believe that these elections demonstrate yet again the strength of democracy in Taiwan. And when people ask what is the underlying basis of your relationship with Taiwan, that is the relationship of St. Kitts and Nevis and Taiwan, I think the answer is that as nations, small nations, we adhere to the rule of law and to the principles of democracy. Democracy can be noisy sometimes, it can be messy, it can be full of arguments and full of discord sometimes, but it is necessary that we adhere to the finest tenets of democracy. And I believe that the elections in Taiwan demonstrate just that, free, fair, and a conclusion that we can all respect. Let me also take the time to congratulate our fellow Nivision, Mr. Fletcher St. Jean. We advise that he has been elected as president of the St. Lucia Banking Association. He is currently the managing director at First National Bank in St. Lucia. Let me also congratulate uh, Mr. Dissil Hamilton for being the newly appointed food and beverage manager at the Mount Nevis Hotel. And of course, I congratulate my dear friend, Casey Jeffers, who, as we know, is making waves in uh, fashion photography. His photographs are now being exhibited in Miami at a museum there. And uh, we look forward certainly to hearing a lot of great things about Mr. Casey Jeffers. We have had, ladies and gentlemen, some young sportsmen and women who continue to do extremely well in Nevis. And we've had some good news recently of some who are going off to colleges on scholarships and some who have already committed to various colleges and are set to leave later this year. I started Mr. Shamari Kamali Newton. He is now at New Mexico Junior College on an athletic scholarship. Similarly, Ms. Tiana Leibard is at Central Arizona Junior College. Both have performed consistently over the years, and this is the next step in their athletic, but also in their academic journey. I would want to uh, extend thanks to Maritza Williams, former athlete, Olympic athlete, who has been working very closely to get opportunities, scholarship opportunities for our young athletes. And Maritza, if you're listening, you're doing an excellent work, and we congratulate you for that, and thank you for that, and young Kamali and Tiana are the beneficiaries of her efforts. I would also want to thank the members of cabinet because they have also uh, provided some financial support for these young athletes so that they could go off and I emphasize not only their athletic journey but also their academic journey. That too is important because at the end of the day, their education will last them a lifetime. In addition, a number of young footballers from Bath United, the official home of football in Nevis, they have been committed to colleges as well. Jamal Lewis and Kamaya Daniel have committed to Southeastern Community College in Iowa, while Omarion Bartlett, Jermaine Bartlett, Trevon Dunard, and Kinesia Dorset have all committed to attend and play football at Ecclesia College in Arkansas. We say congratulations to our student athletes and take this opportunity to wish them, of course, all the very best. Let me segue now into my usual report on our ministries. In the Ministry of Health, I want to say to members of the press that you recall that I spoke at previous press conferences encouraging our women to take advantage of our free mammogram screening at the Alexandra Hospital. I am pleased to announce that 399 women 399 women would have taken advantage of that free screening up to December 31st last year. And that came at a cost of some $79,800. The results are interesting 
because of those 399 screenings, we are told that 96.5% were clear and that some 3.5% were referred as being suspicious. Now, that doesn't mean that those who are said to be suspicious that there is any difficulty or that they have breast cancer, which is what the screening was designed to detect. But it does say that further analysis of that 3.5% was necessary. And I want to use this as a platform yet again to encourage our women folk, particularly those who are over 40, to consult with their doctors to determine if they are candidates for the mammogram service. Unfortunately, if you did not take advantage of the free mammogram, you will now have to pay, I think, $200, which is still reasonably priced. But we did say that for six months last year, it would be free. And then starting this year, January, it would be $200. But what this does, it allows you to know your status. And it allows you, if there is a difficulty, to detect it early and to have it dealt with. Far too many of our people, and in the case of women, far too many of our women are being afflicted by <coughs> breast cancer and are dying from breast cancer. Let me also emphasize that we have sought to offer and continue to offer free pap smears at our clinics, and we just did a large drive in relation to that as well. Pap smears, as we know, are an excellent way to detect cervical cancer, particularly in the early stages. And we have heard and seen from other developed countries that cervical cancer can almost be eliminated if we do what is necessary to protect ourselves. And so I urge again our people generally, but our women folk more specifically, to take advantage of these opportunities. Our grandparents always told us that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And these opportunities are available to you. We are a government that is emphasizing prevention because we think that is the best way to spend money in healthcare is to prevent people from getting sick for as long as possible, to delay for as long as possible the onset of major illness. And so I urge those who have not yet gone to take advantage of these services. And again, some 399 women took advantage of the free mammogram service last year, and I certainly congratulate all of them for making the effort and congratulate their children who encourage them, their friends who encourage them, then their men folk, husbands and boyfriends who also encourage them. That's what we need to do to encourage each other. An important update on our hospital wing. Um, at Alexandria, I know that members of the press have been asking, but I'm able to report that the necessary information that we were waiting for, the final quantity takeoffs, that those are now in hand. We have put together uh, a local committee guided by our project management unit, and they are currently evaluating that information. And uh, we convened an all parties meeting uh, earlier this month, and I'm now told that we expect for the actual construction to resume in the first half of this year. And so I am happy that the impediment that we had has now been removed and that we expect now to be able to move forward with this critical project and to move forward with the construction to get us to a point of completion. And so I thank you for your patience. I know members of the press have kept asking and members of the public naturally. It is an important project and it has been delayed. It has been delayed in my humble opinion for far too long. But we are now getting it back on track, and we expect that we will have that project completed in short order. So I'm happy to report that. A few quick matters in the Ministry of Agriculture. We have the date for the Agri-Expo has been set. It will be the 21st and 22nd of March this year. The location will be at the ETW Park, and our patron is Mrs. Ermin Hendrickson. The theme promoting sustainable agriculture for a resilient future. And so we expect that one and all will go out as we tend to do. This event gets bigger and bigger. We used to call it the, the Agricultural um, Open Day. It is now being called the Agri-Expo. And because in large measure it has grown and grown each year, each year it gets bigger. 
We thank our friends from Saber and Stacia who normally come in their numbers, and we expect this year to see them in great numbers again coming for this event as we continue our cooperation with neighboring islands in food and food security and what we are calling in EVE is food sovereignty. If I can switch to Culturama, I want to thank members of the press and public who tuned in to the press conference that was done by the Deputy Premier as Minister of Culture in combination with the Nevis Tourism Authority and the Ministry of Tourism uh, as he made some very important announcements. And I know you've heard them before, so I can go through them quickly. The Culturama 50 Jingle Competition, it was launched on the 25th of January. The Culturama Secretariat is currently accepting entries for the Culturama 50 Jingle Competition. Jingles, slogans, they should be short and catchy, no more than eight to 10 words to capture the true spirit of Nevis's Culturama Festival. The winner will get two complimentary passes to attain all 50 events, all Culturama 50 events, along with a plaque and cash prize of $500. We also announced the Culturama 50 Island Enhancement Incentive Program. It's a program that was decided upon by the cabinet. What are we trying to do? We expect, because it's not just Culture Armor 50, but we're also having a homecoming celebration, that Nivisions and Kittitians and persons of Nivision and Kittitian descent are going to be coming home in large numbers for Culture Armor 50. And so we are asking our people to partner with us and to improve their homes and businesses, their yard spaces, uh, to in a sense, give the island a lift. And we all know sometimes a simple coat of paint can be a tremendous boost in improving the aesthetics of the island. And so, to make that more possible and feasible, the cabinet has decided that we will exempt persons from duty and from the customs service charge on any purchases that have to do with the aesthetic enhancement of your properties. So if you're going to do fencing, if you're going to do painting, if you're going to be changing windows or doors, exterior windows or doors, uh, anything to enhance and lift your property, we are minded. If you're doing walkways and those, uh, I think somebody got in touch with me and said, what about landscape lighting? All of those things are things that we are prepared to look at. The forms are available at the Ministry of Finance, and we ask that you go in, get the forms. I am hopeful, members of the press and members of the public, that especially in and around Charlestown, that the commercial houses and those who have uh, commercial buildings in Charlestown will use this opportunity and get those buildings looking a lot better, perhaps, than they are. So if you have some work to do, provided it's aesthetic in nature, and I want to emphasize that because some people have already called to tell me they want to add a two bedrooms to their house. This is not what that is intended for. We had programs for that already. This is intended for when you want to lift the appearance of your homes. So if you need some paint, some windows, some exterior doors, as the like, then certainly that is what we are hoping. But it is a huge saving for people who want to do so. So especially, as I say, for those in Charlestown, some of those buildings in town really need a little coat of paint. We're encouraging you to partner with us and get your buildings up to scratch. Uh, we intend as government for those buildings that are under control, are under our control, we intend also to bring those up to scratch and to basically improve the aesthetics of the island as we welcome our friends and family home for Culturama 50. Because again, ladies and gentlemen, we're expecting so many people to come, we already started to have a problem in terms of accommodation. Many of the smaller hotels are already reporting that they're full. And we're having conversations with some of the larger properties to determine what specials they might be willing to offer. But to put this in context for you, I engaged just in December with a lady, one of our own, who lives in Manchester in the United Kingdom. And she indicated at that time that she anticipated that she had a group of just about 50 persons who wanted to come home for Culturama. In most recent conversation with her, that group of 50 has ballooned now to 96 persons who are coming home. And that's just one group. We are aware of another coming out of the UK, which is about 40 strong. And so these are individuals who are looking for accommodation. They want 
to be here with us to celebrate. They want to be on the streets for the juve and to have a good time. And so we got this idea that we can put in place what is referred to as a home stay program. It turns out that when we send a significant contingent up to Leeds Carnival to celebrate Leeds Carnival, which as we know was started by an division, Arthur France, that many of us who went stayed at people's homes. And so what is the homestay program? The homestay program is really designed to encourage individuals to make their homes available if they have the space to visitors who are coming in, of course for a fee, but certainly it's an opportunity for people to make some money, but also to give persons an opportunity. And I'll say a bit more of that a bit later. But the homestay for Culture Armor 50 represents a tourism goal of achieving sustainable tourism and achieving growth in community-based tourism. The goal is for these persons coming in to engage in local culture, local food festivals, and traditions that will be on display for Culturama. As I said, I'll say a bit more of that later. Let me take the opportunity as well, ladies and gentlemen, to say thank you to Monroe College and its president, Mr. Mark Jerome. But I can't say thank you to Monroe and Mr. Jerome without first saying thank you to Mr. Sherburn Green. Sherburn Green is a division. He's a coach with Monroe. And Sherburn reached out to me and Sherburn said to me, would it not be a good thing for Miss Culture, for Culture Armor 50, Miss Culture 2024, to have a full scholarship to pursue a bachelor's degree? And uh, Monroe College, which is well known to us, he suggested that I have a conversation. I want to thank him publicly because he is an example of Nivisions who are in positions internationally who have not forgotten where they're from and who every opportunity that they get try to contribute to the development of our island home. And so Sherman, if you're listening, I want to thank you because through his efforts, he put me in touch with the president of Monroe, Mr. Mark Jerome, and through a conversation with Mr. Jerome, we were able to secure a full four-year scholarship for Miss Culturama 2024. And so whoever emerges as the queen this year knows that they have the opportunity to go off to New York and to get their education there. And so we are very grateful to Monroe and to Mark Jerome and to Sherman Green, who really was the catalyst for making this possible. We have, and I believe it is important that I make the announcement, have lost two leaders from within our Ministry of Education, Library Services, Information Technology, Youth and Sports. The first person who has left us is Dr. Curtis Clark. She was our former Director of Youth and she has resigned from that position to pursue other matters. And we are hopeful that her services will nevertheless be available to the NIA and to the people of Nevis. We would want to thank Dr. Clark for the efforts that she made over the years as Director of Youth and the way that she has brought so much energy to that department. We also want to thank Mr. Brian Dow, a former Deputy Director of Sports, who has also retired from the Civil Service. Both individuals contributed significantly to the development of the departments, and we are grateful for their contributions. We have also had some support staff who have retired at the end of 2023, and we want to thank all of them for their services. Let me say a word about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. As you know, in 2023, the Ministry of Education introduced a STEM initiative, which aims to build 21st century skills in our students through STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. On January 22nd, I was invited to the Four Seasons Resort to speak to a large group who, have, who had come there, a group called FM Global. And uh, when I was finished speaking to them, they surprised me with a very generous gift towards STEM education on Nevis. 
that gift presented to me by Mr. Malcolm Roberts, CEO of FM Global, was in the sum of US $10,000. And I believe that that will go a long way in assisting the education of our children in STEM. And so I would want to publicly thank Mr. Roberts, Malcolm Roberts, CEO of FM Global, and to thank that group for the very generous contribution that they made uh, to STEM education on the island of Nevis. And I would hope that my thanks would be recorded. Let me also thank Sunlink, which as we know is the leading provider of services to large groups coming into St. Kitts and Nevis, because they too were instrumental in making this possible. And I can assure them that this money will be put to excellent use to assist our children as we continue to build out our infrastructure for STEM education on the island of Nevis. Let me also report that the Ministry of Education and Sports has signed a memorandum of understanding with the St. Kitts Nevis Football Association for the FIFA Footballs for Schools program. The memorandum of understanding will allow for financial contributions from FIFA with the aim of providing equipment, clinics, festivals, and competitions for students, capacity building, and access to Football for Schools app for coaches and teachers. The benefits of the MOU, we want to create a fun learning environment for students in the sport of football, provide opportunities for skill development for students across various levels, establish and maintain appropriate training and competition opportunities for student players, collaborate, collaboration of the organizations involved to pool resources for the benefit of schools, children, and sport, and provide opportunities for the development and maintenance of facilities conducive for football development according to FIFA standards. We want to go on record to say thank you to Mr. Tiba Harris, president of the St. Kitts Nevis Football Association, our own Mr. Jamia Claxton, director of sports, and all persons who contributed to making the signing of this MOU a reality. Let me also thank our Minister of Sport, Education and Sport, the Honorable Troy Leibert, because he, perhaps because he's much younger than the rest of us, has been very aggressive in this particular area of youth and sports and youth and sports development. And he has forged a good relationship with Mr. Harris, and we are seeing the benefits of that relationship with the St. Kitts Nevis Football Association. And so I thank Minister Leibert as well for his enthusiasm and the level of energy that he has brought in order to make this happen. The track and field season 2024, as we know, this is sports time. And we have seen a, an increase in the number of meets, dubbed classics, hosted by the St. Kitts Nevis Athletics here on Nevis, with athletes from across the Federation. Now, we advise that the Kim Collins Stadium is under major renovation, and so is unavailable for some of the major meets that would ordinarily be done there. And we are pleased that we could partner with St. Kitts Nevis Athletics to host some of these events here at the Mondo facility in Nevis. And so we are trying, for example, to host the qualifying events for Carifta 2024 at the Nevis facility. And we have the next event, the SL Hosford's Classic, slated for Sunday, the 4th of February. Carifta trials will also take place on March 2nd. We look forward to a packed calendar of school and inter-school track and field meets for the season, and I'm sure that you will be able to access the calendar for these various meets. Uh, I don't need to get into all that. What I will mention, in terms of our inter-school meets, we have the Bank of Nevis Limited High Schools Championship, March 9th to 10th at the Nevis Stadium, and then we have the Gulf Insurance Limited, Bonnie Limited, Nevis Primary Schools Championship, what we call the Mini Olympics, that's happening on April 3rd this year, again, at that facility there at Long Point. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to, before I move on, just say a word. I think when we invested in that facility, there were a lot of criticisms. And in a democracy, that is expected. As I said, sometimes our democracy is a bit noisy. But I think that when we look now and see that St. Kitts their track is out of commission, and that they are willing to come over and do events here in Nevis. It really speaks to the wisdom of the investment that we would have made. Consider for a moment that had that investment not been made, 
that we would currently not have any facility in the entire country where our student athletes and our athletes generally could even qualify to go to Carifta this year. And so I want sometimes that we reflect, because we remember the harsh things that were said. We remember the criticisms about the location and the criticisms about us spending on that facility. But we spent the money. It is IAAF certified, and the results are now being seen, that it can provide a facility where our federation and our athletes across the federation can benefit. And I think that is as it should be. We know that we have some additional investments to make there, and we're doing so over time. But I believe that if we wanted any clear evidence of the value and the foresight of that investment, we are seeing it now. That here is where Carifta trials and all the inter-school meets and inter-island meets will occur because the Kim Collins Stadium is under major renovations. And so I welcome that. I thank the partnership that has developed, the Honorable Samuel Duggins on St. Kitts and the Honorable Troy Leibert here in Nevis. They're working closely together to make some of these things possible. Let me look quickly, ladies and gentlemen, members of the press and public, on the tourism updates. We, as you know, our cruise industry in Nevis is quite small. We cater to little ships, small ships. Um, once in a while, we get a, a larger ship, which is still small compared to the mega ships that go into our sisters and kids. But I wanted to just advise that the spirit of discovery, which was expected to make a call on Wednesday, January 31st, that is tomorrow, it will now arrive in Nevis instead on Monday, the 5th of February. And so I want our stakeholders to be aware. Now, that ship will bring some 999 passengers and 530 crew members, so a total of about 1,500 visitors on that day. So Monday, the 5th of February, we have about 1,500 visitors coming from that ship. It's a spirit of, of adventure, I'm sorry. I said discovery. Forgive me, spirit of adventure. So that is going to happen then. We also expect on February 27th, to have the inaugural call of Emerald Azura with 100 passengers and 76 crew. And so that is generally the size of ship that we cater to. But with Spirit of Adventure, we are seeing a larger ship making a call here on the 5th of February with some 1,500 visitors on board. I did say I would get a bit more specific about our homestay program. And so let me tell you now what the Ministry of Tourism has been doing. Of course, the Culture Armor 50 Homestay Program is a collaborative effort between the Culture Armor Secretariat, the Nevis Tourism Authority, and our Ministry of Tourism. What are the aims? The aims are to satisfy the high demand for accommodation, which is expected and is already occurring in Nevis for 50th anniversary of Culture Armor. We have several large groups have expressed an interest in participating. The Nevis Homestead Program aims to expand accommodation options that are available on the island. And guests will be provided with an immersive and authentic Nevision experience. The initiative supports sustainable community-based tourism. Put differently, we want some of our guests to wake up in Rollins. We want them to wake up down Hanley's Road and in Cox and Brickhill and Butler's. We want them to wake up over in Jessup's and Cotton Ground. Wake up right here in Ramsbury. The idea is to be immersed in the community. The categories, this is important of the homestay, there will be three categories in the program. We have a category that we call in the true Nivision experience, where guests can opt to stay in somebody's home. Then the second category would be guest houses and apartments. And incidentally, let me say to guest houses and apartments that the exemption that we've given on duty and custom service charge extends to you as well. So, if you wanted to change out furniture and the like for your guest house, this is your opportunity to do so under that program where we are partnering with you. And then the third category is luxury division homes and villas. We are aware that Nevis has some fantastic villas which are sometimes available for rent. We are asking if they're even not usually available for rent that you put them into the pool. 
Now, what do homeowners need to do to participate? So if you own an apartment, you have a guest house, you have a private home, you have a luxury villa, what do you need to do? We want you to complete an application form. We want you to bring one form of ID, pictures of your apartment, your house, your duplex, your villa, description of the location of your property, copy of your house rules. So what are your house rules? For example, you may say, I don't want any pets in the house. I don't want any loud music. Uh, those are some of the rules you may have. We want your assurance that the animals on your property will be restricted. Now, that's important because we don't want anybody staying in your home and getting bitten by dogs or anything of that nature. And then we want emergency contact details. That is, if there's an emergency, who would the people call? So that's a very simple process. You can go in to the Nevis Tourism Authority uh, right here in Charleston and get the necessary forms. Visitors. You would need to complete the application form, and we want to see your passport or one other form of ID and your contact details. Visitors will be required to sign a simple agreement with the homeowner, which would include the terms and conditions, cost, duration of stay, and anything otherwise deemed necessary. For further information, please call the Ministry of Tourism, 469-0051, or the Nevis Tourism Authority, 469-7550. And what we intend to do is when you are admitted to the program, so you send your home, you say I have a villa in Rollins, or I live in Cox and I have two bedrooms available, you take your photos, we will put those onto the Nevis Tourism websites, Nevis Tourism Authority. And so the government will partner with you in making what you have available known to those who may be coming in. And so when we put it on the NTA website, those who are coming in can be able to reach out either to you directly or through the NTA, and we put you together. So you make your arrangements. Uh, I should indicate that some people raise questions with me about taxes and all of that. This is intended not to be an imposition on anyone. We recognize that we are asking persons who would not normally have their homes for rent or not normally have rooms in their homes for rent to make them available. And the idea is that you can make some money during Culturama, but also that our guests coming in will have a place to stay and can have an experience, if they so choose, what we're calling the true Nivision experience. So again, the categories, true Nivision experience, where guests can stay in somebody's home. So for those of you who have two and three bedrooms, but your children are now moved out or gone away to college, you may want to rent that bedroom, that extra two or three bedrooms, two persons coming in. We have guest houses and apartments, and we have luxury individual homes and villas. Many of us who live abroad have homes here, and we've gone abroad and we've left the home just closed up. So we're saying, make those homes available if you yourself are not coming home for Culturama. Make them available to family and friends. And once you list with the NTA, the Nevis Tourism Authority, and the Ministry of Tourism will ensure that you are included in that activity. The Malcolm Gishard Recreational Park, ladies and gentlemen, I have said that it's a legacy project for this government. I'm very, very proud of that particular development. I want to thank again the partnership with the Republic of China, Taiwan, which has made that possible. We just celebrated, believe it or not, two years we hear so much about this park that we, some of us may think we have been, we've had it for a long time. It's only been two years. We just celebrated two years. The park with its eight acres of well-manicured grounds and revolutionary turf-covered visitor center welcomed a whopping 42,000 visitors in 2023. That represents a 5% increase in traffic over the previous year. It has also been slated to be the venue for several major events scheduled for 2024. So imagine that, over 42,000 people use that park in 2023. During the course of this year, the second phase, what we're calling the Pinnis Beach Enhancement Project is expected to be completed. It will complement the MGR Park. It will include over 100 parking spaces, improved drainage, road network, restrooms, improved security, other amenities. And uh, 
including that will also be improved waste disposal and sewage disposal, sewage treatment. And that's going to be critical because that second phase, which will also include landscaping, it has a boardwalk, beautiful boardwalk that's already in place. Um, that now will complete, if you will, the overall development of that Pinney's land that, as we know, was the legacy of the late, great Malcolm Guichard. It was his idea, and I'm delighted that we are able to bring it to fruition. Sad that he's not here to see it, but certainly his family are still here. And that is why we, we named the facility the Malcolm Guichard Recreational Park to memorialize the fact that this was his vision, his idea, that we have been able to execute. And so I'm delighted and expect that when this park is finally done, that is the enhancement of the beach side is done, that we will have a first class facility here on the island of Nevis for entertaining, for family outings, and for the like. We expect that Pinnies, which already is a mainstay of entertainment on the island of Nevis, that it will become even more so. Let me extend congratulations to the Four Seasons Resort Nevis. They're celebrating 33 years of excellence and 33 years of service here. They have been delivering an authentic Caribbean luxury with genuine division hospitality and they remain, 33 years on, a shining jewel within the Four Seasons crown. As the first Four Seasons resort in the Caribbean, and only the second in the Americas, the resort has remained a favorite among many return guests, while also continuing to evolve into the stunning property guests have come to know and love over the past 33 years. To celebrate 33 years, Four Seasons is offering a 33% discount on advanced purchases. Guests staying at the Luxury Caribbean Resort can also enjoy a variety of on-property celebratory programming activities and deals all year long. And so congratulations to the general manager, Billy Cueto, and his entire team for seasons celebrating 33 years. I think they have been an excellent, excellent addition to the island of Nevis. And I congratulate them for their longevity and for the employment that they've provided over all these years. While I'm talking about Four Seasons, let me also congratulate them because they have just gained top recognition by USA Today. Ten Best, the Robert Trent Jones Golf Course at Four Seasons Resort, is ranked among the top three courses in the Caribbean. The 18-hole signature course, woven into the landscape of the island and covering some 6,766 yards from the slopes of Nevis Peak down to the edge of the Caribbean Sea. USA Today, in its January 14, 2024 publication, has also named our own Sunshine's Bar and Grill among the top 10 beach bars in the Caribbean. And so I want to congratulate my brother, Sunshine Llewellyn Keynes, and the Four Seasons Resort for being recognized so publicly by a major publication. This year, members of the press, members of the public, we celebrate our 10th anniversary of the Nevis Mango Festival. And uh, we're asking you to join us for an even bigger and better celebration of all things mango. From July 5th to 7th, 2024, prepare to indulge in a juicy adventure filled with tantalizing tastings and the sweetest mango treats. Mark your calendars, please. This will happen, I believe it's right after Music Festival in St. Kitts and just before Culturama. So we have put a mango festival. This should be the time of year when the trees are full of mangoes. And we hope to have a wonderful festival this year. We recognize that last year we were overwhelmed by the numbers. I can assure the public that this year we won't be overwhelmed. We will be ready for you. So we hope that you come out in your numbers and that you experience our Mango Festival this year. It promises to be truly a special event. Now, let me switch to something that I'm very proud of. And that is our movie industry. You know, members of the press, sometimes as politicians, we propose ideas, and we can always be guaranteed in the noisiness that is our democracy sometimes, that when these ideas are proposed, there'll be people who are critical of them. Well, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we recognized that Nevis was on its knees. Our main earner, tourism, was shuttered, borders were closed, Hotels were closed, and the result was that we needed something to ease the pressure 
that we were experiencing. People out of work. And so we partnered with an entity called MSR Media to come to Nevis and to make movies here. And the plan was a very simple plan. They brought all of the equipment and personnel. Because of our good management of COVID on the island, they opted to stay here, shelter in place, so to speak. And then all they did was they brought in the stars. So the actors and actresses came in, they did a movie. Directors came in, did a movie, left, and then they brought in new people. Over the period of some two and a half years or so, they were able to film some nine movies here. Most in Nevis, and I think one of the movies uh, incorporated scenes in both Sinkits and Nevis. And so we saw this as an opportunity to create something new from scratch. MSR came and we think that they did what they said they would do on the island of Nevis in terms of making movies. That's why we partnered with them. That's what we asked them to do and they have done so. We recognize that they later engage with St. Kitts, and we nevertheless are proud that if we are to develop this industry, that Nevis is where it started. And we have not sat on our laurels. We are now looking to see what more we can do. And I have some announcements to make in that regard. But before I get there, let me congratulate MSR Media and let me congratulate all those involved because the movie entitled The Island and produced by MSR Media, it is now streaming on Stars Network. And this movie is a thriller. Nevis, I'm told, is a real star in the movie because it captures Nevis in an awe-inspiring way. But that movie, The Island, has been the number one movie on Stars Network's top 10 movie list now for the past several weeks. So if you're at home and you have stars, you're streaming, The Island, Film in Nevis, has been the number one movie on stars over the past several weeks. I'm advised just this morning that the movie will now be also available on Amazon Prime from the UK. And so we are hopeful that it does as well on that platform as it has done on stars. I say that to say that Oftentimes, when we have, again, ideas which are revolutionary, ideas which look beyond what we consider to be normal. And when I talked about a movie industry, a film industry, many scoffed and said, what nonsense is the premier talking? But here we have a movie, The Island, number one on Stars Network for the past several weeks, and now premiering on Amazon Prime. And we are asking those who have not yet seen it to take a look and to feel proud that this is an example of what we can do when we think outside the box and when we seek out partnerships that can move the island forward. But the island of Nevis is not resting on its laurels. And so I'm proud today to announce that we will be introducing something called the Taste of Hollywood acting master class. It will be done on Saturday the 2nd of March and Sunday the 3rd of March, 2024, from 1 to 5 p.m. each day at the MGR Park. It has been facilitated by a woman called Juliet Jeffers. You heard the name Jeffers? It's a Nevis name because Juliet is a daughter of Nevis. Juliet Jeffers is an award-winning actress, writer, director, producer, and educator. She is and has had many roles. Some roles on television you might recognize, some of the programs. She has been on The Young and the Restless. She has appeared in Murder, She Wrote. She has appeared in Saved by the Bell, in Martin, in ER, if you're like me, you watch a lot of ER, in Grey's Anatomy, Modern Family, Criminal Minds, Law and Order. She has appeared in all of those series, sitcoms on US, major US networks. She has also appeared in some 18 films. That is actual movies that she has appeared in. And so we think that Juliet Jeffers is eminently qualified to lead our Taste of Hollywood 
master class in acting. Now, why is this important? This is important, ladies and gentlemen, because it is the next evolution. We're not just talking about people coming in and making a movie and then leaving. We are also talking about having skill sets developed locally. Who knows? The next Cicely Tyson might be listening to me right now. The next great actress or actor might be in school right now looking for an opportunity. And so we invite you to register for this acting master class with our own Juliet Jeffers. And we thank her for giving back. You remember I mentioned Sherwin Green earlier at Monroe? Reaching back to Nevis and giving something back. This is Juliet Jeffers, who has an excellent career in film. Reaching out to us and saying, what can I do to help? And so we are partnering with her. I want to thank the Four Seasons Resort Nevis, our main sponsor of this event, our NCDF, Nevis Cultural and Development Foundation, and the Nevis Tourism Authority. This is being done under the umbrella of a Nevis Investment Promotion Agency. Um, bear in mind that film is one of the areas that we have designated as a growth area and an area for investment on the island. Registration opens on the 5th of February. It goes until the 23rd of February. And what will be covered during these master classes? The basics of acting, improvisation, character development, scene study, memorization techniques, and on-camera audition techniques. The idea is from these acting classes is to prepare our people. For those who already have the acting bug because they got small parts in the MSR movies that were filmed, we encourage you to come and hone your craft. And for those who are interested, we also encourage you to come. I must tell you that the memorizing, memorization techniques is of interest to me because I saw one script for one of the films that was being done here and uh, a part that involved, I think, just two speaking uh, engagements. And I wondered how on earth anybody could memorize all of that that they had to say. So it gives us a good opportunity, a window into the world of film and I encourage our persons. Now, what I think is important, it is free. There's no cost. So the acting class is free, but, but we can only accommodate 30 persons. So please, if you're interested, registration opens on the 5th of February. It closes on the 23rd. After we get to 30, we're going to have to close off. So we're hopeful that you get in early, and this is something that we're committed to and will continue to do. So I believe that's a good headline that Nevis introduces a taste of Hollywood acting master classes coordinated and facilitated by our own Juliet Jeffers. Quickly to public works, I want to assure the good people of Butler's that we intend to complete that project there within the first quarter of 2024. Um, what I'm told is left to be done, a final layer of asphalt and the completion of the junction, the Butler's Community Center we are also preparing for the good people of Brown Hill to construct the road next to the basketball courts in Brown Hill, the road that takes us, of course, into Brown Hill. We will do that, and uh, we are working on that. Let me just say also that in the context of water, we are pursuing our water drilling project. We have received some bids, as you know, but we did ask for some additional information and anticipate that we'll make a decision shortly on the successful bidder so that we can proceed with the bidding and with the drilling, I'm sorry, to get additional water into the system. You may have seen a notice being circulated about water rationing. I would want to encourage our people to continue to be responsible in the use of water and to ration as much as possible, to conserve as much as possible. We are already seeing early signs of diminished rainfall already hitting us. And if you look around the island, you're already seeing the effects of that diminished rainfall. So I'm hopeful, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the press, that you can help me get out the message that it's important that we conserve water. A 
word to the general public. The government took a decision about, I believe it was two years ago, that the solid waste charges, we would move that charge from the, your electricity bill to your water bill. Why did we do that? We did that because we realized that there were more people who were registered for water than they were for electricity. And the idea was that we would try to spread that stipend, that support for our solid waste collection over the broadest possible group of people. We said it would be 25 EC dollars per month per household and 75 EC dollars per month for commercial enterprises. I want the public to understand that this is a contribution that you're making to helping to keep Nevis clean. And for 25 EC dollars per month per household, you should have your garbage in most places picked up up to three times per week and disposed of. Sometimes some communities get twice collection per week, but most get three collections per week. 25 EC dollars, or I believe on a 30 month that is 30 days, that's less than $1 per day for your garbage disposal. For commercial houses, commercial businesses, places of business, it is $75 per month, which again for a 30 day month, it works out to just over $2 per day. I say that because our people sometimes attack and engage with a level of ferocity to say they shouldn't be paying that or they shouldn't be paying anything. And I'm asking our people again to be responsible. $25 a day, $25 a month, forgive me, for garbage collection, three days per week. There's no way that that is anywhere close to the true cost of what garbage collection is. And if, for those who are so reluctant to pay, consider the alternative. Your garbage doesn't get collected. Your garbage piles up across the island. And what is the result of that to our health, to the image of the island, to our tourism industry, and to the sustainability of our environment? So I'm asking members of the public, please, because what I'm understanding is happening, the water department is saying, just as Nevlek used to say, that people are coming in and they don't want to pay the solid waste fee. They're saying they're going to pay their water bill, but they're not paying the rest. I want to make it very clear that the water department has no authority to waive the solid waste fee. The solid waste fee is there, as I said, as a contribution spread across the society to allow us to continue to maintain our trucks, our collection, our staff, and to keep Nevis clean. And I can't emphasize enough how important that is. I want to commend the board, Andrew Hendrickson, the manager there, and the entire team. Because I believe if we are fair, that we will all say that they have done an excellent job in keeping Nevis clean. Despite the challenges and despite the outcry that we get sometimes, we all can be proud that they've done an excellent job in keeping our island clean. The days of trash being piled up anywhere on this island, those days are long over. And I want to commend them, but also ask for the partnership of the Nivision people in relation to this important initiative. Some people, for example, argue and say, oh, I don't generate much garbage. Or it's not fair that I should pay because I don't generate any garbage. I'm simply saying to you that it is a shared cost. That's the idea behind it. And the example I used to explain it to someone who came to query it the other day with me, I said to them, look at Social Security. 
most of us will never benefit from Social Security until we retire. Or, God forbid, if we become sick. But we are paying. So from the moment you start working at 18, you're paying into Social Security, hoping that at 62, you're going to get a benefit. You know why? Because the idea of it is that those who are of working age, strong, healthy, and working, will contribute to ensure that those who are in their retirement can get a benefit. It is how societies are structured. It is designed for us to help each other. And so it is no answer to say, well, I don't generate a lot of garbage to refuse to pay. Because a clean island benefits everybody. And garbage piling up anywhere on the island affects everybody. It affects our health. It affects the image of the island, it affects the environment, and it affects our all-important tourism industry. I never say to keep Nevis clean for tourists. I always say keep Nevis clean for Nevisions. And if tourists come and enjoy our clean island, then that's extra. But we need to understand that this is a commitment, ladies and gentlemen, to our environment. And so I ask our people to go in and pay and understand that if you don't pay, that your service can be cut off. I don't want anybody going without water. So when you go in, please pay your bill. $25 a day. I heard a program, a month, I'm sorry, $25 per month. Thank you very much. I heard a program, I was on a program recently, and a lady called in to say that a school teacher that at school, her students were getting $25 per day for lunch. $25 per day for lunch. That's what her students, the parents were giving her students to come to school with. And so I just want you to reflect on that. That we spend $25 or more each day on lunch, on meals, and that is important, but we are reluctant to spend $25 per month, less than a dollar a day, to keep our environment clean. So I'm encouraging our people, please. And while I'm encouraging you to pay your bills and to help us, partner with us, to keep these services going, I'm also encouraging you not to dump illegally, not to throw trash out of your windows. I just drove along the beautiful bypass road that we have just completed and it has just been marked and I continue to encourage people please when you use the brand new roads drive carefully the roads are so smooth a fellow tell me he's speeding and he didn't realize because the roads are so smooth he's not feeling any vibration in his vehicle and it's only when he looked at the speedometer he realized that he was well over the speed limit so I'm asking you to be sensible when you drive again you hear my theme all along I want our people to be responsible. Do not speed on the roads. Well, I was driving along the road there, and we have cleaned up the sides of that road, and I was truly shocked at the number of plastic bottles, which clearly were in the grass, but now the grass has been cut. They're visible to the naked eye. And that means that people are throwing them out their window as they drive. Nivisions and residents, we know better. And if we know better, please, let us do better. Let us keep the island clean. And let us, with one voice, condemn anyone who is dumping illegally or engaging in any of those activities which really is inimical to the island of Nevis. I end my presentation on a very positive note. And that has to do, ladies and gentlemen, with the availability in fact, I would say the tremendous availability of scholarship opportunities here on the island of Nevis. And for those young people out there, people desirous of studying, who might be listening, we have the Taiwan ICDF scholarship. The deadline for application is February 8th. February 8th, so that closes in nine days. The Taiwan MOFA scholarship, the deadline is February 21st. The University of the Virgin Islands, UVI scholarship, the deadline is March 
28th. The OS Organization of American States Scholarship, the deadline is March 6th. Ross University Veterinary Medicine degree in St. Kitts, there's no deadline. You can apply at any time. University of Medicine and Health Sciences, Windsor University in St. Kitts, no deadline. You can apply at any time. We have scholarships to Turkey. The deadline is February 4th, Valentine's Day. So while you are buying your flowers for Valentine's and your gifts, I want you also to make your applications for these scholarships. We have scholarships to Romania. The deadline is March 16th. We have scholarships to Monroe College and the NIA because we have partnered with Monroe on some scholarships. And the deadline is March 28th. We have the general NIA financial assistance that we offer every year to students. And that process is now open, and the deadline for applications is March 28th. Now, I want to emphasize, because especially for NIA assistance, a lot of parents call after the deadline and say, oh, my child just got word, and can you help? And we are adhering to the deadline strictly, please. The Application process is now open, and the deadline is the 28th of March this year. So I'm begging you, please don't come in June and July to say you want financial assistance, because by then, the budget is already exhausted. We have budgeted an amount. The deadline is the 28th of March. Please get your applications in by that deadline if you want NIA financial assistance. But let me go through again, because training is critical. It's an important part of what this government is seeking to do. Taiwan ICDF scholarships, deadline February 8th. Taiwan MOFA scholarships, deadline February 21st. UVI, University of the Virgin Islands scholarships, deadline March 28th. OAS, Organization of American States, the deadline for applications March 6th. Ross University, Veterinary Medicine, no deadline. University of Medicine and Health Sciences at Windsor in St. Kitts, no deadline. Scholarships to Turkey, February 14th is the deadline. Scholarships to study in Romania, March 16th is the deadline. The Monroe and NIA scholarship, the deadline is March 28th. And if you are studying online or seeking to go away and you want to access financial assistance from the Nevis Island government, your deadline to apply is March 28th. They did not mention on this list, but we also have the MUA, Medical University of America scholarships. We have two scholarships, full year university scholarships are given each year. And I ask that you look out for the announcement because that application process should open shortly. So I say all that to say that those who are genuinely interested in studying, in training, in advancing themselves, there are a number of opportunities available to you, a number of pathways available where you can study. Whether it's at UVI, whether through the OAS you want to study in Latin America, in Canada, in the United States, or any of the OAS countries, whether in Taiwan, and Taiwan has given you two bites, ICDF scholarship and separately the MOFA scholarship, whether you want to study in St. Kitts at Ross, or Windsor, you want to study in Turkey, learn a new culture, a new language, you want to study in Romania, in Europe, you want to go to New York or St. Lucia for Monroe, where they have campuses, or you want to go anywhere in the world, or study online, the NIA financial assistance is available. Please, we can only make things available. It is for you to have the initiative and to apply. Don't say you didn't know. Don't say you didn't hear. Take advantage of these opportunities. You can contact at our Human Resources Ministry here at the NIA, Mrs. Shanola Murray-Gill, Ms. Carissa Griffin, or Mrs. Shelley Leibert. And the number here, right here at the Social Security Building, here at Pinners, you can call 469-5521, and the extensions are 5164-5166, or 5163. They've even given me their email addresses. Carissa.Griffin at NIAGovKN.com. 
Shelley.Jones Liburd at NIAGovKN.com and Shanola.MurrayGill at NIAGovKN.com. So I gave you all phone number, I gave you all email addresses, I gave you all the contact persons, I gave you the address of the Ministry of Human Resources, and I gave you scholarship opportunities and the deadlines. Can't give you anything else. The rest is up to you. So I ask you please to do your best and to take advantage of these opportunities. Let it not be said that young people don't have opportunities in Nevis because we're making these opportunities available to you. That's my presentation. I invite any questions that you may have. Good morning, Mr. Premier. Good Elke morning. Hewlett, Department of Information. Yes, Mr. Hewlett. Um, okay, some parents and students have been complaining that despite being approved for student loans from the Development Bank, they're having some difficulty um, being able to draw down on these funds, and this is creating them some hardship. So what can you say to those persons? Has the third member of the Integrity Commission been appointed? And if so, what was the process? Having held at least the first public consultation on their proposed um, airport expansion project, what has the feedback been like from the citizens and the residents, and when will the next one be, if that has already been decided? You would have met with the team from Southern University late in December. Can you speak to those discussions and possibly what could come out of a relationship? They already have a relationship with St. Kitts and Nevis, but specific to Nevis. Someone at Nevelek charged me with asking a question um, with regard to the 5% in salary increase for public servants that the NIA would have paid. And I would just like to say, say thank you on my own behalf. Um, you, the got person, you got increase? I think so, yes, sir. Oh, okay. Do appreciate it. Um, I'd have take eight, but I'll, I'll settle for five. I'm grateful. Uh -huh. um, if yeah, we give you so eight, then take back three. Ta oh, that's okay. I'll, okay. I'll keep All the five. Right. Okay. right. So I was wondering, based on what the person was asking, do the public statutory corporations get increases when the government pays salary increase? Um, I had a whole ton of questions, but I think I might leave it as that. Uh, the Poultry processing plant that was announced. Um, we broke ground, I think, in June 2023. Can you give us an update on that? And while I asked that, Mr. Andre Huey from SKN Newsline asked if you could speak to why a delay because the equipment would have been brought in, I think, early earlier in 2023, if I'm not mistaken. Social Security. You raised the issue of the viability of the Social Security scheme during the budget debates on St. Kitts, the federal budget debates. Um, and it's, you know, its current trajectory and considering the announcement made by the Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, Dr. Terence Drew, with regard to increasing payouts. Can you share your views on that matter for us from this rostrum? And I think that's it for now. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hewlett, I believe you have asked me to engage in a second press conference because the number of questions you've asked here. Um, let me take them in turn. Um, you are correct, Ms. Hewlett, that some families have been crying out because they have secured student loans from the Development Bank, and those student loans have not yet been disbursed. And so a lot of these youngsters are already away studying and have not been able to access the student loans. I can tell you that we had an historic meeting, joint cabinet meeting with the federal cabinet, Prime Minister Drew, and his cabinet journeyed to Nevis and met with the, the Nevis Island Administration cabinet. And we had very fruitful and frank discussions, and this was one of the matters that was raised. Uh, the Prime Minister did indicate that they inherited a development bank that essentially was bankrupt and that they are now trying to fund those various programs that the Development Bank has been committed to. He indicated that those student loans that were already in place have in fact been funded, and the new student loans, that funds will be made available once, of course, the government funds start flowing. As we know, each year is a bit of a delay until 
the, 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 the tap is turned on, so to speak. So he, the, the, the date that he gave was that by the end of January, we hope that additional funds would be made available to Development Bank from which they could disburse to these students. So I would like to assure those students and families in Nevis, many of whom have reached out, that this was a matter that did occupy our attention, that we did engage in conversations with the federal government, and that the result of that is that we are told that by the end of this month, January, that funds will be made available. So we are hopeful that that will translate into some relief for those families in very short order. The third member of the Integrity Commission, you ask a very important question. But I think it's a question that requires me to take just a moment to give some context. We introduced integrity in public life legislation in Nevis, and I'm proud to say that we operationalized that legislation since I have been the Premier of Nevis, and we have been filing our returns in Nevis as required by law. Unfortunately, the structure of the commission requires that there be a commissioner appointed on the advice of the Premier, a commissioner appointed on the advice of the leader of the opposition, and a chair appointed by the Deputy Governor General in her own deliberate judgment. The chair has to be someone who is a lawyer or judge with a minimum experience of 15 years. Under the, as originally set up, we did not have a leader of the opposition because the Honorable Joseph Parry, who was then the member of the NRP in Parliament, stood alone. And under our constitution, to be leader of the opposition, you must have the support of at least one other member. He had nobody else to support him, and so he stood alone. However, recognizing the need to have the, com the commission constituted and recognizing the critical need to move this process forward. Mr. Perry and I would have, as we were always engaged with each other, to have conversations. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the reality remains that in a democracy, for it to function properly, you need ongoing dialogue between government and opposition. It is critical. The government today could be the opposition tomorrow and vice versa. And so there is a need for ongoing dialogue and ongoing engagement. Mr. Parry understood that. And so Mr. Parry and I were able to speak to certain matters that impacted this island, including integrity in public life. And we came to an accommodation. And on his recommendation, the Deputy Governor General was willing to accept, because he was the only member of the opposition, that a Mr. Tyrrell, Alfred Tyrrell, would be appointed to the Integrity Commission. And so the commission was constituted. Mr. Sidney Newton, the member appointed on my recommendation as Premier. Mr. Ricardo Keynes, as a chair, appointed in the deliberate judgment of the Deputy Governor General. And Mr. Alfred Tyrrell appointed on the advice of the then sole member of the opposition, Mr. Joseph Perry. That commission's tenure has come to an end. And there's therefore a need to appoint a new commission. We were satisfied with the performance of Mr. Sidney Newton, and so we have recommended that Mr. Newton be reappointed. The Deputy Governor General, in her wisdom and in her own deliberate judgment, has reappointed Mr. Ricardo Keynes as the chair. That now only left the person to be appointed by the opposition. We are aware that we had an election in December of 2022. And the result of that election is that two members of the NRP, the Honorable Cleon Stapleton Simmons and the NRP leader, the Honorable Dr. Janice Daniel Hodge, were elected. They were successful. We are also aware, because it has become a matter of public knowledge, that some falling out appeared to have occurred between the two ladies. And as a result of that, the Honorable Cleon Stapleton Simmons was not prepared to support the party leader as leader of the opposition. 
that matter escalated and it got to a point where the Honorable Cleon Stapleton Simmons was expelled from the party. And so we have a situation now in the Nevis Island Assembly where on the opposition benches there are two members both elected on an NRP ticket but once since expelled from the NRP and two members who are not together. We therefore have a problem because it means there's no leader of the opposition and unfortunately there has been no dialogue as had hitherto been the case in terms of how we resolve this. The result is that the integrity commission has come to a stall in Nevis. To try and meet this impasse, not created by us, because the electorate gave the NRP two seats, and if the NRP had its house in order, there would have been a leader of the opposition. In fact, if the NRP had its house in order, there would have been an opposition senator sitting in the parliament as well. Neither has happened because the two elected reps could not agree. In fact, the suggestion is that they violently disagreed with each other. So, that is the situation that we found ourselves in. And it appears that no amount of encouragement or cajoling could get the two elected reps from the NRP to come to a meeting of the minds. So we were forced as government to go back into the parliament and to seek to do two things. One, to reduce the tenure of the members of the commission from five years to three years. The second thing we sought to do was to find a way to deal with a situation where we have people in the parliament, but because they're not getting along, they're not cooperating, that we are unable to achieve the objectives. And so the commission now has two members properly appointed, chair, Mr. Keynes, and the member appointed on the advice of the premier, Mr. Newton, but no body on the advice of the opposition. There's no leader of the opposition. And so we amended the law to say that the third member will be appointed on the advice of the leader of the opposition. Where there's no leader of the opposition, that person will be appointed on the advice of the member of the opposition, and that is to take care of a situation where there's only one person there, and where there are more than one member of the opposition, then that person is to be appointed on the advice of them collectively. Put differently, so that I break it down so that everybody could understand. There's no leader of the opposition currently. There's no lone member of the opposition because there are two. And so the third member of the commission is to be appointed on the advice of Janice Daniel Hodge and Cleon Stapleton Simmons together. That is, the legislation anticipates that the two of them will come to a meeting of the mind and say that Tom, Susan, or Harry is our nominee. The legislation went on to say, absent that, then the Premier of Nevis will have the opportunity to suggest a third person. It is not something that I want to do. To be more specific, Ms. Hewlett, I have already appointed or had somebody appointed on my advice as Mr. Newton. I would like the third member to be appointed on the advice of the two members of the opposition. So it is up to them, the onus is on them, to send a little letter to say that Mr. Jones is our nominee. And we jointly agree that Mr. Jones should be our nominee. But if they are unable to get past their personal differences and unable to put country above self and recognize the importance to the good governance agenda of the integrity in public life legislation and the proper constitution of the Integrity Commission, then the legislation says that the Premier will have to act. 
And I want the public to understand and the press to understand. I don't want to act. I want them to do what they're supposed to do. But if they refuse, then we will have no choice but to act because absent our action, the entire process will collapse. There will be no integrity commission in Nevis. And so I am publicly calling on the two members of the opposition to come together, to engage with each other, and to come to a conclusion and to advise the Deputy Governor General of their nominee. We cannot wait indefinitely for them to do so. And so if they don't, then we'll be forced to appoint the third person so that the commission could be constituted. While I'm on that, let me also encourage people who are caught by the legislation in St. Kitts and who are required to file in St. Kitts, please to do so. The Director of Public Prosecutions in St. Kitts is saying very publicly that he will start to charge and prosecute people. I don't want anybody to be charged and prosecuted, and especially the people over here in Nevis. We are proud that the Honorable Alexis Jeffers, the Honorable Eric Evelyn, the Honorable Latoya Jones, and myself were the first four persons to file with the Integrity Commission in St. Kitts. The first. We filed right away. Once the law came into force, we went ahead and we filed. We marched up the steps and we filed because we thought it was an important indication of our commitment to that process. So I am not, Alexis is not, Eric is not, Latoya is not under any threat of charges. So if there are other persons who are caught by that legislation, I'm urging you please to go in and do what you need to do. I recognize that some in Nevis have said that it is onerous for them to file in Nevis and also file in St. Kitts, and we are having a conversation with the Attorney General to seek going forward to ameliorate that position. But until changes are made, those who are caught, I'm asking you please go ahead and file. I don't have no money to help you pay a lawyer. So go ahead and file. We don't want any charges laid against anyone. And in my mind, to my mind, because you're in the habit of filing in Nevis, it is not too difficult because all you have to do is to adjust the information and file it in Sinkits as well. So I'm urging persons to do the right thing and to file with the Integrity Commission. I understand it's an imposition. I understand some people say, well, the fast, what the government want to know my business for. But we can't say we want better governance. We can't say we want more open and transparent government. And at the same time, we say, but we don't want anybody to know our business. Open and transparent government is not just a matter for the politicians. It's also a matter for those who serve in critical areas in the government. And so we ask that people do the right thing. I have given a long answer to a short question. But I wanted the context and the background to be understood. And to say, Ms. Hewlett, that if necessary, I will have to act to appoint the third member of the commission. But I hope it won't be necessary. Because I hope Dr. Janice Daniel Hodge and Cleon Stapleton Simmons, honorable both, that they would be able to come together, despite the differences, put them aside, and come to a meeting of the minds as to who this individual is to be. Is there a time frame? The legislation did not dictate a time frame, but I think even where legislation doesn't set time frame, we'd expect a reasonable time. And in my view, a reasonable time is already gone. But this legislation was passed since last year, and they have not, I have had no indication that they have come to a meeting of the minds. So the legislation puts the responsibility on them, as the members of the opposition, to advise. And we have not yet seen anything from them. So it's a matter that we'll have to look into. There's also, of course, the reconstitution of the Integrity Commission at the national level. I don't think your question addressed that, but I just want to say that I've been invited to nominate as leader of the opposition somebody to that commission, and we are working with the other members of the opposition to determine who that nominee should be. And so that will be made public once we have that information. The airport public consultation, we had one consultation 
I believe that the consultation did not go as well as we would have liked in large measure because the person who should have made the presentation was unfortunately fell ill. And rather than canceling it, we decided to go forward with it. And the gentleman who did the presentation did not have as much command of the English language as perhaps we would have liked. And the result was that it wasn't as engaging. And a lot of people expressed concern that they couldn't understand all that was being said. We have gone back to the drawing board. And I spoke, in fact, to the Honorable Alexis Jeffers yesterday, who's leading on that project for the government. And uh, uh, he's indicating that we should have a series of public consultations we start in, in March of this year. If all goes well, we expect construction to start this year on what we propose to do there. And uh, we are hopeful to be able to come to the public with some concrete information in terms of financing and in terms of the plans. The architects are now finalizing plans. The project um, consultants are finalizing the designs. Because remember, it is not just the airport. We are also moving the island main road. And I can tell you that we have given instructions that the necessary purchase and sale agreements be prepared since we have negotiated a price to acquire the lands in the area. So those lands that are, I believe, uh, to on, the, on the, the mountain side of where the airport currently is, um, those lands we have come to some agreement with homeowners, landowners in the area. So we are for formalizing those now. And then the land that is uh, headed towards Nisbet Plantation, which will be required for the extension, we are working with the owner in terms of an exchange of property that we are seeking to ensure that he's properly compensated for his property so that we can move forward. Again, the new project will in involve um, an enhanced and lengthened runway. It will involve new lighting on the airport. It will involve a new parking and apron. It will involve a new fire hall. It will involve um, a new tower and tower facilities. It will involve uh, an improved terminal. And it will certainly involve a fuel farm to provide fuel. And we will change the trajectory of the road in order to ensure that we have a secure property. I'm advised that the original plan some time ago, which would have involved the relocation of those homes and buildings and restaurants on the ocean side, that that is no longer the case. And so those should not be affected by the um, new alignment uh, that we are proposing. So um, those, that's good news for those people. I think there's a restaurant there called Drift and some homes along that side, they should not be impacted by what we are seeking to do. So we will come to the public with more information, but I can assure you that the work is ongoing the consultants are now here in Nevis, living, embedded in Nevis, and so we hope that we will be able to move this forward with some alacrity. You asked me about um, Southern University. I thought our discussions were very fruitful. The MOA that the MOU, I'm sorry, that they have signed with the federal government um, will have some benefits for the students of Nevis as well. For example, they are exploring credits from Fitzroy Bryan College being applied to their programs there. And we want the same for the Sixth Form College in Nevis. And the concessionary rates that they're offering will also be available. They're also offering some programs online. Uh, so we hope that Nevis and students here will access those as well. Southern University is a historically black college in America. They have an excellent reputation. And we look forward to working with them. One of the things as we continue to talk about uh, a marijuana industry. They have programs dealing with marijuana, farming, and management of that process. And so we hope that we can learn a lot from them. Uh, Nevlek is asking about a 5% salary increase. All of our statutory corporations are run by boards. They are not NIA workers. They're not public servants. And so it will be for their boards to determine what is possible in terms of increases, bonuses, and the like. Those are all determined by their boards, not by the central government, since they don't work for the central government. 
poultry plant, you're absolutely correct that we had a groundbreaking. Um, we have had, unfortunately, some delays in the start of that actual project because of the bidding process. The Honorable Eric Evelyn has reported as a Minister of Agriculture that the original person that we thought could have done the project, um, that person uh, stepped back due to ill health. And so we now are asking for different persons to bid on that project. So we anticipate the project will definitely move forward this year. And uh, that project is twinned with our acquisition of a large tract of land that we also hope to make available to farmers who want to grow birds. So you'll hear more about that in the days and weeks ahead. Um, the equipment, yes, that has been purchased, but that's secured. So what we're talking about here is the construction of the facility itself in which the equipment will fit. Social security viability. I don't know if there's more that I could add, Ms. Hewlett, to what I said in the parliament. What the point I was seeking to make is that the last actuarial report that we saw from security, social security actually sounded the alarm to say that we had to do some things in terms of reforms in order to ensure the longevity of social security. And uh, the, the, the actual report made a point that St. Kitts and Nevis was lagging behind the rest of the region in terms of those critical reforms. And so I raised the point then because the Prime Minister was announcing uh, even larger burdens, if you will, on Social Security, larger payouts. Not that I'm opposed to a person getting a higher payout, because I understand that the cost of living continues to be a problem. But the question was, in light of the last actuarial report, how would this be sustained? So I believe that what is necessary is that if we are going to concern ourselves with the long-term sustainability of the Social Security Fund, then we have to study very carefully the recommendations made in that actuarial report to ensure that that fund continues, Ms. Hewlett, to be available so that when young people like you and I get to that age, we can benefit from Social Security. So that is my um, suggestion there that that would need to be looked at. Are there any other questions for me? Good morning, Premier Brantley. Good morning. Donella Thompson, Vaughan Radio. With the large number of persons expected for the Culturama Festival 2024, is the NIA, by extension, the Nevis Water Department, confident in its ability to provide an adequate and reliable water supply during that period? And it was previously announced that an analysis would be done by the Ministry of Education et al on the new system done in the secondary schools with how students are placed in their classes. Are you at liberty to speak on the results of the new system in education? Thank you. Thank you very much, as always. Excellent questions. Um, the question you ask is a question I am asking myself because I've said to the Minister of Responsibility for Water, the Honorable Spencer Brand, uh, how are we going to ensure that we don't have any collapse in the water system if we're expecting thousands of people here for Culture Hour. Because remember, people want their wet fit, people want to go out, people want to come home, shower, go back out. There's going to be a tremendous pressure on the water system. He's aware of it, and one of the things we're doing is I spoke earlier about the water drilling. So we're hopeful that we can expedite that and so get additional water into the system in time for July, late July, early August when we expect the island to be inundated with persons. We are also asking people to conserve so that the pressure on the water supply is not inordinate leading up to the season. We are also, of course, having a very robust tourist season. And so that too is putting pressure. So I'm talking about even now, the hotels are full, the hotels are doing well, we're having a very robust season. So all of that combined means that we're going to have pressure on the system. The only way to relieve that pressure is to ensure that we have additional water and we practice conservation. So the minister has his marching orders from the cabinet that we need to proceed with alacrity to get the drilling done and to get some new water into the system to try to alleviate those concerns that you've identified. We also, of course, have the desalination plant that has been promised and talked about for a long time. 
I'm told, however, that they now have contractors in place, etc., to move that forward. That, we expect, is going to provide nominal relief as well. It is not a major plant, but we expect that every drop helps. And so we anticipate that that also will be the case. We have a lot of construction that is happening. And um, we are also asking that where persons are doing their construction, that they have some kind of water catchment, whether it's a system or water tank um, attached to their residence or business so that we can capture rainfall when it does come. Because as we know, a lot of rainfall that we get, we lose it. It just runs off and goes into the ocean. So we need to capture and retain more of the rainfall. If we're getting less rain, it makes sense that we capture as much of it as we can when we do get it. So we encourage persons as well. And I will use, use my home as an example. I have a cistern at my home. And uh, we, at my home, do not use government water for at least, I would say, six months out of the year because we catch water in the cistern and use the cistern water instead. So if that can be replicated across the island. We understand that homes will be different sizes, families will be different sizes, but if it can be replicated, it helps to take the pressure off of the water system if more homes. There are actually homes in Nevis, I'm told, which have cisterns, but they're not connected. It, may, it doesn't make any sense to me, all right? Spouting isn't connected to the cistern. So you have the capacity, but you're not doing the basics to get it there. I think all of that is important. Some people have cisterns, but they don't have no pump. So the water is stored, but it's not being pumped into the house. All of these are things I think we need to look at. So your question is excellent. We are aware of it. We're trying our best to ensure that we have what's necessary. You asked about the analysis done on education. I confess I am not aware if it has been completed. Nothing has come to my attention. So I will have to investigate where that is because I've not yet seen the results of that analysis. I'm not sure if it's still ongoing or if it has been completed, but I've not yet seen the report. So I'll have to find out on that. And while I've been talking to you, members of the press, I got some additional information which I thought I would share. Um, I have a correction. I'm told, I said that the mammogram now is $200. I said the Ministry of Health has sent me something to say $250, not $200. So I apologize for that. $250. The Public Health Department they executed their usual pap smear drive. It was done at Charleston General Health Centers, and we had 86 women who participated, so I thank them for coming out, and I trust that all is well. I also have some good news. Two of our doctors, our local doctors at Alexandra Hospital, they've received scholarships for specializations. You all know that I've complained that our young doctors need to look to become specialists, well, I'm happy to announce that Dr. Chanel Maynard has gone to Cuba to do obstetrics and gynecology, and Dr. Crystal Paris Keynes has gone off to do radiology. So I congratulate both of them, and they have done very well. We also want to announce that Dr. Yoshevel Abregantia, a highly qualified dentist, she has joined us at the Gingerland Dental Unit. She's from the Dominican Republic. As you know, the government provides dental services in Gingerland and in Charlestown. And so we, we welcome Dr. Abrogantia. She has joined us. And then we have just uh, had a team member added, a nurse, Hoshinkum. She has come all the way from India, and she's joined our community health nursing team. We continue to encourage very much individuals to settle outstanding bills at the Alexandra Hospital, please. We are trying our very best to meet the costs of delivering health care. We cannot do that if persons are not willing to pay their bills. I mentioned already what we're doing in terms of the Alexandra Hospital expansion, so I don't need to get into that any further. Let me, before I take the next question, um, if there's any, uh, just say a word. We have introduced the non-established pension scheme for non-established workers. After a lot of years of talk, we finally got it done. And uh, I'm pleased to announce that so far, some 26 persons have received payment um, in pensions, $154,882.81. And in terms of gratuity, $1,900,864.94. People even now, when we're asking people to proceed to retirement at 62, 
Why 62? Because at that age, they will be eligible to get their Social Security. And for those who have worked for us, for government, in any position for 10 years, they will get a gratuity, plus they will get a monthly amount by way of pension. We have a committee that is in place, headed by our Permanent Secretary and Premier's Ministry, Mr. Wakely Daniel, and I would want to say to those who are moving on into retirement that you're not moving on empty-handed. It is important for me to say that because I recognize that there has been some anxiety expressed by some. They don't want to go, they, they, they don't want to retire. How are they going to live? And uh, our simple explanation is that you're not leaving empty-handed like before. Before we introduced this scheme, when you left Government is an any worker. You're left, as the old people say, with your two long hands. We have changed that. So you're now leaving with something, and you're going to get something every month through the mechanism that we have created here in Nevis. We recognize that at the national level, the Honorable Prime Minister has announced that the legislation passed way back in 2012, that that will now be actioned and operationalized. But... Remember that that is a contributory scheme, meaning that some monies will be taken out of your pay so that you could get a pension when you retire. In Nevis, we are still operating a non-contributory scheme. Put differently, no money is coming out of your pay, but we are making provision for you to get a pension. We will have to assess internally where we go, in terms of how quickly we'll be in a position to introduce a contributory scheme. But certainly for 2024, we are not deducting any monies from your pay in Nevis. And so I think that that's an important distinction because I've even heard some people complain in Nevis that the Prime Minister announced 8% salary increase in Sinkids and we are only giving 5 in Nevis. Well, the truth is we're not only giving 5 because from 2013, when this CCM administration got into office, until now, 2024, time frame of some 10 years or thereabouts, we have had a 10% salary increase, and now we've had a 15% salary increase for a total of 25% salary increase in nine years. That is what public servants in Nevis have received. And I hasten to add, because sometimes we get accused, those of us in cabinet, that those of us in cabinet have not had any increase in our salary during that time. It's important that I make that point, because when we hear the argument being advanced by some that 8% was announced in Sinkis, how come I'm only getting 5? You're not only getting 5, you're actually getting 15. It was spread over the course of 2022, 2023, and now 2024. I'm happy to hear Ms. Hewlett say she got her 5%. But remember, at the 8% in Sinkits, the Prime Minister explained he was given 8 because he's going to take back 3. So I want you to understand that we're giving 5, we're not taking back anything. So our people must pay attention to the details because I think that that's important so that they understand. And I remind public servants in Nevis that they're not employed to the federal government. They're employed to the NIA. Just as federal public servants are not employed to the NIA, they're employed to the federal government. And so we need to cut our suit in Nevis to fit the cloth that we have, and we need to live as much as we can within the means that we have. So I just wanted to say that to our workers who are moving on into retirement. Nobody's trying to do anything to you. I want you to be assured that we have a system in place that will continue to allow you some measure of income in your retirement years. And we're hopeful that with Social Security plus this little pension that you're getting, that you'll be able to live. That was the whole purpose behind it. That you get your gratuity from us, you get a pension every month, you get your Social Security that you're able to live. Because as I said, a lot of people have been calling and do not want to retire. They are complaining, they're saying, oh, I still have strength. We appreciate that, but also remember that we have younger people coming out every day looking for something to do as well. And so 62 
We never asked anybody to go until we had put the retirement benefits in place. It is only after we did that that we say that persons can transition out because they're now leaving with something, not like before, when they left with nothing. So I just wanted to make that point and to thank all of those for their tremendous contribution over the years. And those who have got to 62, some are a little older than that, and they have gone into retirement, that they really should have nothing to fear because the government has made a way to allow them to live in retirement comfortably. And for those who are approaching 62, because I already some of them calling and grumbling, to tell them, put their house in order. Because at 62, we're asking persons to transition into retirement. They can go and do other things, of course. But we're saying from the government point of view, we are providing you with a gratuity and we're providing you with some measure of a retirement benefit so that a monthly amount will come to you. And we had a big meeting at NEPAC when we explained the details. But if you still require details, please, I ask you to talk to your prominent secretary and to have access to the chair of the committee, P.S. Wakely Daniel. They will explain to you how the system is designed to work. But so far, we've paid out in terms of gratuity $1,900,864.94. And so far, in terms of pension, we've paid out $154,882.81. And I'm told some 26 persons, based on the report, have already benefited. And so all of those who are going, you have our commitment that we will continue to do the right thing by you and ensure that you're taken care of, both in terms of your gratuity and in terms of your pension. Ms. Hewlett, you have something more for me? Okay, Hewlett, Department of Information. These questions are from Andre Huey from SKN Newsline. He says, thanks for the update on the Alexandra Hospital and asks if there is a projected completion date now that things are looking like they're going to move forward. Um, his words, as leader of the opposition, there has been some criticisms nationally that the opposition is weak and is too friendly to the government rather than vigilant in pointing out the shortcomings of the Terence Drew administration. What assurances can you provide that the opposition is in no way compromised in its role? Those, again, are from Andre Huey, SKN Newsline. Yeah, well, thank Mr. Huey for his, um, his questions. On the first question, the issue of the completion date, I have not been given a date um, uh, as yet, and I wouldn't want to say something in terms of a date, only to be later told that I said this date and it wasn't done by that date. What I have been given is a date to say that work should recommence within the first half of this year. And uh, we are aware that the external work on the hospital is done. It is now the internal work that was keeping us back. We're now ready to go. So I would be in a much better position to give an update as to possible completion once we restart um, that work. Uh, so that's the best I could give on that. I don't have a date in hand that I can share at this press conference. The opposition being weak, um, I don't know who Mr. Hugh is listening to, but Mr. Hugh is a sensible person. Um, in my engagements with him, I've always found him to be a sensible uh, journalist and a sensible individual. And I feel that um, people must understand that because the opposition isn't cussing, doesn't make it weak. Because I am not engaged in what is a normal expectation of oppositions, which is to cuss the government. It doesn't mean that we are weak. We have mechanisms in place for discussions, and I have said that my preference in dealing with the Dr. Drew administration is one of dialogue and one of discussion. Dr. Drew, I'm sure, will say that when issues arise, I have raised those issues with him. The fact that I don't raise them on radio or I don't raise them in parliament doesn't mean that they're not raised. You ask me, for example, about the development bank and the student loans. Now, I could have gone in parliament and berated the government for the fact that Poor people, children are out there in school and can't get their money. And perhaps some would say, boy, that opposition doing its job. Instead, we met with Dr. Drew and we raised the matter with him. And he gave what I thought was an acceptable response to say, this was a difficulty and the monies will start to flow by the end of January. 
Does that mean that I was not effective? Because at the end of the day, what does Mr. Huey and the public want? Cussing or results? And I think that is a decision that we'll have to take. We have become accustomed to the idea of government being politics, I'm sorry, being adversarial to the point where nothing a government does is good. And the opposition must criticize everything that the government does. If you listen, for example, to what passes as opposition in Nevis, it is a constant barrage of nonsense. Not one solitary idea as to how we can advance the island and advance the people. Just cussing. Look what Taiyi wear today. Look what Suti wear today. He sounds so foolish. Corrupt and wasting the money. That is all. No prescription for how we actually move Nevis forward. So the position that I have taken in my role as leader of the opposition, a role that I have because I had the support of the majority of members in the opposition, is a role of constructive engagement. Mr. Hugh, if you're listening, constructive engagement. That does not mean weakness. That means that where we can join ideas to make St. Kitts and Nevis a better place, then we will do so. Where we see government policy that can be made better by way of recommendations, we will do so. And yes, when we see that there is a need for criticism, we can do so. But I want to be very clear that if people are looking to assess the quality of opposition by the extent to which the opposition is costing the government, then I am not so inclined at this point to engage in that type of politics because I don't think at the end of the day that there's any benefit to it. We have a government in sync that is only about what, 18 months old now? means that they have a very long time to go before there's another election. So what people want me to do, cost for five years? Or they want me to get some things done? I mean, that's the reality. And the reason I commented on Mr. Huey's undoubted intellect is that he really, when people said that, he should have been answering them for me. He should not have been asking me to answer them. He should have been saying, but it must be obvious that what the opposition is seeking to do is to engage with the government to see how we can refine and make better policies. And so if you hear me now in the parliament, when bills come, we are actually making suggestions and recommendations as to how the bills can be made better. Why? Because we're there to serve the people, not ourselves, and not just to try and score some political points. We're there to serve the people. And I would encourage any opposition anywhere, including the opposition here in Nevis, to do likewise. The government doesn't have a monopoly on ideas. The government does not have a monopoly on good sense. The government does not have a monopoly on how to move the country forward. So if you have an idea, if you hear, for example, that we are going to be drilling for water, and you say, but you know, you could get more water if you were to do this instead. Well, bring the idea to the table. Not like some who spend all of their time costing everything you do. All the time. That's all they do. And cannot point to a single idea that they're brought to the fore to benefit the people. You can't say you love people and you want to serve people and you can't have any suggestions for how we move them forward. And so Mr. Huey, the opposition led by me at this point is engaged in constructive engagement. We are engaged constructively with the government, bearing in mind that our goal is to serve the interests of the people who elected us and to get results for them. And uh, the fact that I'm not engaged in costing anybody does not make me or the opposition weak. If people 
listen, actually listen to the deliberations in the parliament, you'll realize that we have departed in some respects, we have suggested in other respects, but ultimately we are all committed to creating a sustainable island state in St. Kitts and Nevis, and we recognize that Nevis cannot do it alone, and St. Kitts cannot do it alone. The NIA needs to work with the federal government, the opposition and government need to work together. In five years' time, the people are going to make the decision as to who they want to take us forward. But until then, they have already taken a decision, and we whom they have sent must work together to ensure that the country gets the benefits that we deserve. And so I hope that that's a fulsome explanation to Mr. Huey and the one or two people who might have said to him that the opposition is weak. I don't think weak and Mark Brantley normally use in the same sentence, but clearly as I get older, I learn new things. So Mr. Huey, I hope you understand that we are not weak, but taking a different approach to leadership and an approach that we hope will be judged fairly by the historians when they come that it was an approach that was intended to get maximum benefit for our people and to have the benefit of the, the experience and the intellect on the opposition side as well. Because there are people in the opposition have a lot to offer. A lot to offer. But if the culture is that once you're in opposition, you have no suggestion or recommendation to make, all you could do is cost, then what then is the value? What is the value? I ask rhetorically this question. The people of St. James elected the Honorable Dr. Janice Daniel Hodge to represent them. If you members of the press could tell me one idea, one suggestion, one recommendation that she has made to benefit the people of St. James, I will give you credit for doing so because I can't find one. Cussing me and cussing the government is different to advancing ideas for the benefit of your constituents. It's different. You need to show, I think one, was it Connors who sings, show me a trophy. You need to come and say, well, these are the things, look here. I've recommended these 10 things. Miss Ponce over there in Brickhill need this done. Mr. James up in Butler's need that done. And if you cannot do that, and all you can point to is you wake up every month and cuss the premier. Then, you're not serving the people who elected you. If we announce that this is the road down which we want to go for a, different, a particular project or a, different, a particular program, we announced the other day that those mothers, single parents who are having a huge problem getting daycare, that we will provide some assistance. And you say, no, as an opposition, this is not the way. Or you say, instead of giving $300, you should give 600 that now you're getting into a debate, you get into an exchange of ideas. But simply waking up, cussing. Sometimes I wonder if they sleep with the government on their mind because from earlier morning to late at night, it's an obsession. And all you do is cuss, 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 cuss. Cussing never help a soul yet. Never help a soul yet. And all of us know how to cuss. All of us. Well, as the, young, the young reporter here from Vaughan, he's too young to know yet, but certainly the rest of us. Because it's an easy thing to do. Advancing ideas and suggestions and recommendations is far more difficult. And you know what I hear them say sometimes, Miss Hewlett and Mr. Hugh, if you're still listening? They say, oh, if I give them my idea, they're going to steal it. What, what name, sir? If you are committed to developing your country, so you mean if you don't get into government for 10, 15 years, you don't share no idea for 10, 15 years because you say people are going to steal it? Share your idea, do so publicly, and if they steal it, well, what they say? Imitation is the best form of flattery. So if they steal your idea, it means it was a good idea, and you stand up and say, I'm happy. I call for them to give people $600 instead of three, and they have done so. That's how, to me, the politics ought to work. But simply cost, cost, cost all day. Three, four, five programs a day, cussing. At the end of the day, what value is it? Call people all kind of names and make all kind of outlandish accusations against people. At the end of the day, of what value? None. And so, 
if that's the way strength looks, then that's not the strength that I'm looking for. I'm looking for an engagement that leads to the best results for the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, and more specifically, the people for the island of Nevis who have sent me to Parliament to serve them. Anything further for me? No? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Members of the press, thank you for being here for our very first press conference for 2024. I hope that we can continue in this vein where we have an opportunity to exchange views and for me to be questioned and hopefully to provide the answers to the question that you ask. So I thank you. I thank NTV for being here and for covering this and look forward certainly to engaging with you next month, God willing. Thank you.